Well, folks, you better buckle up those seat belts. Get ready, boys and girls. It's about to get crazy now at this point in time, folks. Yeah, we got a few things to get into in, in today's video, folks. Some very important things that are happening out there that I need to show you, okay? And uh, let's just put it this way. The next 48 hours for this market is absolutely monumental. And I mean absolutely monumental. And uh, this is a make or break moment for the market overall. And uh, I got a few things to show you, a few things to talk about, kind of my expectations on a few stocks, what's going to happen here, many other various things. I appreciate y'all joining me as always. Thanks so much, folks. And thank you for being subscribed here as always. So first place I just want to start today's video is congratulating my fellow Palantir bulls, because I know there's, a, you know, Palantir is a very popular stock in the retail community. I mean, very popular, almost freakishly popular. And there's a lot of people that, you know, were down big on their shares or were buying last year and whatnot. And uh, it was tough sledding for quite some time. And obviously the stock has come back in a pretty epic way, right? Um, you know, look at us, for instance, in the public account, we're now up 88% on Palantir shares, now up $42,000 in profit now at this point in time. But it was tough sledding, I know, for a lot of folks, because a lot of folks kind of, uh, you know, found out about Palantir kind of in 2021. So they might have been buying at 20 bucks, 18 bucks and things like that, right? And now they've just been kind of like average, they were just averaging down for like a year, year and a half, pretty much, right? And the stock went all the way down to six bucks. So it was tough sledding, right? And a lot of people were able to get their cost basis down in the stock to $9, $10, $11, $12, things like that. And so that's awesome. But um, it was tough sledding. But Palantir is looking like it was, you know, one of those opportunities that was buy the dip and never trip, right? And where this, what happened here might have ended up being the best gift ever to investors when, you know, everybody disbelieved. And it was a tough stock to obviously be buying at that particular time because there was slowing growth rates. There was a lot of, you know, worries about this and that. And um, obviously, it looks like Palantir has made it through and made it to, to better days, okay? Now, m personally, what do I expect for Palantir uh, stock price kind of moving forward, okay? I will say this, and what ha okay, I guess we'll switch cameras, okay? We'll be on this camera now, okay? Alrighty, well, here's a potato for you, all right? We'll, we'll just switch cameras randomly. Palantir stock, what I'm expecting is if this company actually comes in and they do really good numbers for this past quarter, but more importantly, they guide for very strong numbers in the back half of this year and going into 2024, right? And if Alex Carp has anything that positive to say about longer term growth rates, I think the stock's on its way to 18 and then probably 20 plus, okay? Um, so that's my personal opinion. Now, if the company comes in and let's say they report really disappointing a quarter for whatever reason, okay? Let's say the numbers aren't there. Let's say they barely beat estimates. Never, we won't even talk about if they miss estimates. That would be a whole disaster. But let's talk about that they barely beat expectations on the revenue side, right? And they don't have any strong guidance or anything like that. Stock will fall right back down to 12 bucks if that was the situation. I'm not expecting that. And I think there's a pretty low probability of that happening. But just to be aware, if that was to happen, let's say they barely beat because they would lose all momentum if they had no strong guidance, if they had, you know, numbers that just barely beat expectations. People are expecting, you know, growth rates to, to ramp up and ramp up pretty considerably in terms of the investor community now at this point in time, right? We're looking at analyst expectations as a lot of retail investors are saying these numbers are far too low. Like companies can do much better numbers than this. So they got to come through and actually prove it now at this point in time. So, you know, happy for that. A lot of retail folks are obviously starting to make really good amounts of money in Palantir. One stock that breaks my heart though is Meta, right? You know, Meta is a stock that was such easy money last year and a lot of retail didn't buy the dip on Meta. They didn't even buy Meta, right? And this one breaks my heart. By the way, look at the, how big the moves are starting to be in terms of meta, right? A 1% something move now is $7,600 up on the day, right? Just because that position is just building so big now at this point in time, right? But it breaks my heart because I don't think nearly as many, you know, let me know in the comments section if you own meta. If you own meta stock in a portfolio, let me know in the comments section. But from what I see, there's just not a big meta community out there. And it's kind of sad because I'm looking, I'm like, this is one of the easiest money-making stocks in the market. And it just doesn't seem like people are participating. Like for instance, I did a meta dedicated video. Um, I think it was last week, video did horrible. And, and that just goes to show me like a lot of retail folks just aren't interested. So let me know if you own the stock in the comments section. But from what I've seen, it just seems like Unfortunately, a lot of people did not buy that ridiculous dip we had in Meta, even though it was slam dunk easy money. I mean, we're talking about this is such an easy money stock. Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Messenger, Oculus. 
I mean, the metaverse, now you're talking about threads. Like, it's the place you've got to go if you're going to advertise. They, they are the creme de la creme. Like, you know, if you're going to advertise as a business, you're going to their platforms before anywhere else. Such an easy money stock, great balance sheet. You got Zuck. Like, you know, it, it's been kind of frustrating to kind of see, like, people just not participate in that one and be able to make all this money. But it is what it is. Uh, PayPal. I do think... There's a lot of people that are buying the dip from the retail community in regards to PayPal, okay? And I think, this is my personal opinion, I'm a believer that PayPal is going to be a great retail investor stock here. I think it's going to make folks a lot of money. Now, for me personally, my biggest worry when it comes to PayPal stock is actually not this stock going down. My biggest worry for PayPal stock is this stock going up and going to 100 plus and it happening very, very soon. Now, where do I think this stock's going after earnings, okay? If earnings come in, they don't need to beat by a lot. If they just beat a little bit and they have some sort of announcement in terms of, you know, CEO, CFO future there, I think the stock's 85 plus pretty quickly, okay? If they still don't have any update uh, on the, because they're going to get asked that question. If they don't address it in the press release, believe me, analysts are going to ask them, what is going on with the new CEO search, okay? If they don't have much to add, I think it's going to continue to be an overhang on PayPal stock. I think everybody's looking for like, like, are we going to get this announcement soon on like who's the future CEO and CFO of this company, right? That's what people are really waiting for. It's not even really in the numbers. I think the numbers are going to be just fine and if anything, exciting, but people need that. So if we can come in through with, you know, just slight beats, never mind if there's big beats, but if we can come in with slight beats, a little positive commentary and something in relation to who the CEO of this company is going to be in the future or that the, the search is, you know, coming, you know, let's call it almost finished up here. Maybe they got it down to two candidates or some sort of commentary. I think, you know, 85 plus will happen quickly. I mean, you could literally be talking about the day after earnings. So my biggest concern with PayPal is not going down. I hope the stock goes down as somebody that wants to continue to buy the stock for the remainder of this year. I hope this stock goes down. My big concern is this baby flies on earnings and after earnings. And next thing you know, it, you know, it's pushing 90 bucks, it's pushing 100 bucks. So we'll see what happens there. Um, I'm hoping it stays lower for longer. Let's put it that way, okay? Uh, Fubo, this is another stock I kind of hope works out, not just for myself, but for other people. I know there's, it's one of those, you know, kind of speculative stocks. It's not like a PayPal or a Meta or, you know, Tesla or some of these stocks that are more, you know, huge companies that are just kind of seen as like, you know, they're going to be around relevant and making a lot of money, right? Fubo is obviously a big risk stock. It's a big risk reward stock. And um, I, I, I hope it, I hope it works out. I hope it does well over time, you know, because I think it's uh I think it's a pretty exciting opportunity and we'll see where things kind of shake out there over time. But uh, it would be nice if something like that could work because, you know, I think there's been a lot of, there hasn't been, I mean, of the unprofitable companies, there's almost been no one that's come through and done something good other than maybe Palantir, right? Because Palantir was unprofitable and then recently they flipped and obviously look what's happened with Palantir stock price. I mean, it seems like just anything unprofitable just hasn't worked out. And it'd be nice if finally one of these unprofitable companies can work out and become that type of, you know, 10x plus type opportunity. Maybe it's Fubo. Maybe they're the ones that come through. We'll see where it all shakes out. Um, it's, a, it's Like I said, it's a very risky stock, as all unprofitable stocks are. But if it comes through, my gosh, it's a game changer, right? You know, I definitely had a lot of people, uh, you know, kind of asking me about these MJ stocks, okay? The plan is a good example. Uh, Avant's a good example, okay? So let me, let me talk about those, okay? So... First thing is, if you've been watching these stock prices of these stocks, they're showing, in my opinion, a, a kind of like a bottoming out type formation here with these stock prices. I've been kind of watching them for the past month. I personally believe stocks like Avant, Planet, if there's any other good quality MJ players, which there might be one or two others, there's not that many high quality players in this space. I think they'll actually start to show quite a bit of momentum in the back half of this year and as we go into 2024. That is my personal opinion on that. Now, a lot of people are looking at the space in general and they don't like the presidential candidates that we're likely going to have to choose from, right? Because it looks like we're going to have likely B-Man, T-Man, and DeSantis, okay? Those look, as of today, like the three possibilities. And I don't think the market likes any of those three. But with that being said, I think a lot of these stocks have already kind of bottomed out. And so I think they'll likely start to see momentum, my personal opinion, in the back half of this year. I think the market has kind of bottomed those stocks out in terms of stock prices and in terms of kind of uh, pricing around the actual product. And so we'll see what happens. But my, my opinion is 
they'll probably start to show strength in the back half of this year and as we go into 2024, despite the presidential situation, which obviously that's not really a positive. And there's other folks in government that hold key positions that have big weight um, that are trying to push things through. I know a lot of people don't like AOC, okay? And But at the end of the day, I think AOC and some of her friends are trying to push some stuff in on this side. And so, you know, she's actually grown a lot in influence over the last few years, especially because her social media following is one of the biggest you'll find for any politician out there in general, right? So we'll see what happens. That's my opinion. I, I think these stocks will start to show strength in the back half this year and then going into 2024. So with that being said, I can't really put more money in these stocks right now. I already have a lot of shares of these stocks. I have so many Avant shares, it's coming out of my ears, okay? And so many Planet shares. So where I'm at with these is I'm waiting for profitability. When they hit profitability, I'll be happy to continue to buy shares. But, you know, with how much I had put into profit, uh, unprofitable stocks, especially in like 2021, in the very beginning of 22, like, you know, I'm at that moment in time where I'm just kind of like, show me profitability, then we can talk. So that's my opinion on kind of those MJ type stocks, okay? Now, Disney's a stock I started a position in recently, right? And don't laugh at it, okay? It's a, it's a very small position, but I did start a position. It's $800, okay? And I'll be honest, the more I've looked at Disney, the more I'm like, do I actually want to build this into, you know, a position that's tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars? And the more I've looked at it, the more I'm like, I don't know if I actually do. I mean, the company's very debt loaded, right? But you can say, okay, big deal. They got a million great businesses. But even some of their businesses are giving me some caution. When like, I look at ESPN, uh, they're trying to cut a lot of cost on the ESPN side right now. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen there. You know, some of their TV networks, their movie catalog is not insanely strong right now. I'm even looking at things like this. Walt Disney World crowds vanish, parks at their emptiest in 10 years. Look at this. Data provided by Fox Business was touring plans uh, showed how long guests had to stand in line on average for Disney's four parks in Florida and two in California. Decreased quite a bit on Independence Day when compared to the previous year. Those times. And I was trying to think, well, previous year was Independence Day on a weekend. And no, I believe it was on a Monday uh, the previous year, right? Uh, those times, which calculates based on times available on Disney's apps, can often be a signal of big crowds the park is hosting. Hollywood Studios saw the biggest decline in its average posted wait time on July 4th, going from 44 minutes in 2022 to 18 minutes this year. So, I don't know, I was looking at some of that stuff too. And then also, I'm considering this. And by the way, this is the reason in this is so worrying is like, like, travel's insane right now, right? It's still insane. Like, travel's a red-hot sector. You know, listen to what the hotel operators are telling you, right? Uh, listen to what all the Vegas hotels are telling you, the res Vegas resorts. Listen to the numbers coming out of Macau right now. Listen to what the cruise line operators are telling you. Listen to uh, what the airline companies are telling you. It's a red-hot sector. And I mean, as red-hot as red-hot gets. And to see some of this stuff when the sector is about as good as it gets is, is a little worrisome, okay? Then on top of that, right? Disney ramps up spending in California amid, obviously, the battle with DeSantis. And I'm just looking at all that, and I'm like, ah, I don't know, man. Um, do I really want to build Disney into a big position? And the more I've looked at it, the more I'm like, I'm not so sure. It looks like a steel deal. The stock's $88. But it, I have a lot of concerns on so many fronts that I, I'm not sure if this is one I actually want to buy the dip on. Um, and maybe it's one of those. I'm just like, I think there's better places to put my money. And that's kind of where I'm leaning to. So I might sell that 800 bucks of Disney at some point in time and uh, might focus on another stock rather than Disney just because I don't know if I want to get in the middle of all that crap, man. When you're talking about this big old legal battle with, with one of the potential uh, presidential candidates, when you're talking about, you know, everything that's going, I don't know, man. <laughs> The parks being slower than expected, like all this stuff. Plus, they got a mess on the TV network side. I'm like, I don't know about this. So anyways, Disney, I don't know about that, okay? Linda Yacarino, the new CEO of Twitter, what does she say? She says, uh, don't want to leave you hanging on a thread. Ha, 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 ha. Hilarious, okay? You thread, get it? Threads. But Twitter, you really outdid yourselves. Last week, we had our largest usage day since February. Maybe that was because everybody was coming to check to see if Threads was uh, trending on Twitter, which I believe it was. And then all of a sudden, it magically disappeared from trending. Oh, I thought we weren't supposed to... Uh... 
block things on Twitter. I thought this was supposed to be the ultimate, uh, just let it go, whatever it is it is, but suddenly Threads wasn't showing up anywhere on trending. Hmm, isn't that funny when we uh, play certain rules about that? I wonder if somebody said something super negative about Elon. If it, oh, no, 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 we won't even go there, okay? So th that's out there, right? Uh, this person says there's only one Twitter. When you're totally not worried about the fact that 100 million people signed up for threads in five days, right? Uh, yeah, that, that's kind of a... Uh, shows me that they're definitely a little worried about kind of what's going on here uh, with threads, right? When you're starting to talk about the competition and this and that. Yeah, they definitely see it as a competitive threat. We'll see what happens there, right? I heard Elon, from what I hear, Elon sent Twitter employees basically an email stating that he's not happy. He's not happy with how fast they're moving on product, uh, you know, like, you know, getting things done. Um, from my understanding, Elon's not happy. And he sent out this email, I believe, in the last 24 hours from what I heard. And... I think, honestly, the reason he's doing that is really because of the pressure from threads all of a sudden, right? When all of a sudden you feel that competitive pressure, you're much more likely to, like, get on your teams, right, and be like, da, da, da. And then a lot of people are saying, well, why is Elon doing that? He's not even the CEO of the company anymore. Why is Linda not the one doing that, right? Which does kind of make you think, like, why isn't she the one that did that? Why was it Elon that did that? So, I don't know, you know. I don't even honestly care what happens with Twitter. The only reason I care is because Elon's the CEO of Tesla, and obviously that's an important position for me, but we'll see what happens. All I know is Elon needs to get off this whole fight thing, okay? Zuckerberg put out this photo. Man's looking like he's ready to brawl, okay? See, the problem with Elon, I'll tell you the problem with Elon. He thinks he can beat up Zuckerberg because he's bigger than, than Zuckerberg, but the problem is, you know what? Elon never played any violent sports. I don't think Elon never played any sports. If he would have played some violent sports, I think he would have learned like not to underestimate guys that are a little smaller because believe me i'm six three and i can tell you there's a lot of dudes i can whip my butt okay that are probably five eight five seven five nine like if somebody knows some stuff like they can whoop you know a lot of people's butts let's just call it that and so unfortunately elon hasn't played violent sports before so he doesn't really know like i know he's never boxed he's never done mma he's never played tackle football he's never done anything violent like that you learn when you do some violent stuff that, man, some dudes can mess you up that are not, uh, that's called very big in stature, okay? And I think Elon might have to learn this lesson the hard way. Now, the market is about to be wild here, folks, okay? So June CPI, I don't know if you guys know the expectations, uh, but here's the expectations, okay? So according to FactSet, the CPI is forecasted to rise 0.3% in June after rising 0.1% in May. Core CPI is forecast to rise 0.3% for the month versus 0.4% in May. The CPI, which core takes out energy and, and a few other categories, right? The CPI year over year is forecasted to rise 3.1% in June after rising 4% in May. Now, this is a big number to keep in mind, okay? 3.1%. Core is also going to be important, right? Core CPI year over year is forecasted to rise 5%. These are the very important numbers to, to keep in mind here, okay? Now, I think we're looking pretty good. I think we're looking pretty good in terms of coming in uh, with kind of what the street's expecting here. Maybe a slight beat. I don't know. We'll see. But I think we're looking pretty good as far as that goes. But where things are going to get interesting is not just in terms of what the numbers are, but then how does the Fed react to those numbers, right? Because the Fed's very data dependent. So they're going to look over these numbers and kind of make decisions in terms of what they want to do with rates moving forward, but also in terms of the commentary, right? Are they going to sound more hawkish, dovish, or kind of middle ground? Now, Jerome Powell, I think if, you know, especially if core CPI beats, let's say core CPI comes in in the fours, and let's say, you know, let's say real CPI still comes in at three one, something like that, but we have core in the fours, I think it's going to be really tough for Powell to come out super hawkish. I, I You know, he can do it. I just don't think the market's going to buy it at all. I think he would have more credibility if we come in with, let's say, a four something on core and three one for, for just overall CPI. I think it would be better and have more credibility if he comes in just kind of in middle ground. He's not really coming across as dovish. He's not coming across as hawkish. He's just kind of in the middle. I think that would be the best thing for Powell. And I think that would, I think the market would appreciate that. If he comes in super hawkish, he's just going to look like no one's going to believe him. They're just going to call BS. You know what I mean? Because if you're talking about CPI coming at 3.1, this, you know, at peak, we were at 9% plus. It's come down pretty much every single month now for a year straight, right? And it's clear as day, like we're getting closer and closer. Basically, the Fed wants to get this down to 2%, right? 
I mean, we're one percentage point away from where the Fed wants us now at this point in time. So we're getting really darn close. And we know Fed funds rate is 5% plus, And there's supposed to be lags, lags when it comes to that, right, in terms of how it hits the economy. So my personal opinion is we're looking pretty good here. Um, we'll see what Powell does. I think Powell should just be kind of, you know, in between. I don't think he should come across too hawkish or dovish. That's my opinion. And I think the market will respect him if he does that. If he comes across super hawkish, I don't think the market's going to respect that at all. Okay. No. Another thing for, for Powell to consider is this, and I don't think a lot enough people look at this, okay? There's a commodity index. Now, commodities matter in a massive way. Why? Because everything you possibly do in this world, you have to use a commodity to get that something to, you know, uh, for production, right? Whether we're talking about steel or oil or natural gas, like everything out here, it comes from some sort of commodity pretty much, right? So when we're talking about GSG, this is the ultimate way of kind of tracking commodities over time, right? In terms of GSG, it is actually down slightly for the year, which is great. That's phenomenal. And that's versus the Qs, which are up nearly 40%. So this is another indicator that I think Powell and the Fed should take into account that commodities aren't moving. Despite the market looking great, commodities aren't moving at all. Commodities are down double digits versus this time last year. So we're looking pretty good as far as that goes. Everything's going exactly as planned. Fed needs to just chill now at this point in time and just kind of play middle ground. And then once they actually get several months of in the twos, then they can go dovish and then they can go and, um, you know, call victory. But don't call victory yet. Just kind of be that middle ground right now. That's where Powell needs to move here, okay? Now, public account uh, today just closed at, I believe, the highest it's been at since uh, 2021, right? And... You know, I, I kind of think about that and it's like, you know, is this crazy or anything like that? And the way I kind of think about this is not really uh, at all, to be honest, right? Because if we look at like the S&P 500, we're still many hundreds of points away from an all-time high on this S&P 500, right? And obviously, we should see a, a, a much strengthening earnings picture at the end of this year and especially in 2024, right? Energy is going to hold us back a little bit for the next few quarters, but... I think 2024 should shape up to be, as long as the economy continues to hold up, which so far has held up pretty darn resiliently, right? As long as that holds up, we should be up very nicely Q4, Q1, Q2 with earnings per share for S&P 500 uh, and talking considerably up versus like 2021 type numbers, which means the market ultimately should be quite a bit higher than it was uh, back then. So if you're talking about, if you're thinking about, you know, S&P 5000 or something like that, it's really going to come down to earnings, right? Which is what we're about to get into in a massive way here with earnings season, right? The banks kick it off on Friday, right? So basically you got tomorrow CPI, next day Fed, the next day, all the biggest banks that control the money in the world are going to be reporting their earnings. So it's about to get pretty darn wild, folks. And um, yeah, appreciate everybody joining me as always, folks. Thanks so much. Uh, if you're looking to apply from a private group, I invite you to apply. That is the pinned comment down there. We'll see if you're a good fit for there. If not, all good. Much love. Appreciate you. And have a great day.